Welcome back. Chapter 5, Part 2 here. We're going to take a look at the eukaryotic organisms themselves. We're going to run through some different examples of the most common types of microscopic organisms from the eukaryotic kingdom, the uh, eukaryotic domain that is. And uh, these will include things like the fungi, these will include things like the protozoa, the algae, and the helminths. We touched on all these back in Chapter 1, but we're going to go into a little more detail here in Chapter 5. So we're going to start with the fungi. Fungi are uh, their own kingdom, technically referred to as Kingdom Mycetae, but we just usually refer to them as the fungi kingdom. Um, something like 100,000 known species of fungi, probably many that have not yet to be discovered by science. And they occur in both a single and multicellular form, if you recall from chapter one. The truth is most are single cell and it's only those that we typically notice that we would consider multicellular. So just looking here ahead real quick, the, the mushrooms are considered the multicellular fungi. Now a real quick note about the multicellular fungi. I know we don't usually talk about larger organisms, but there's an interesting concept to, to discuss just real quick about them. And that is when we, when you, when we think of a, of a fungus, the first thing that might pop in your head is the mushroom, like I just showed there. And the truth is, the mushroom is actually one of the life cycle stages of a multicellular fungi. It's not necessarily the fungus itself, it's actually just one of the life stages that it goes into when it's ready to release spores and reproduce, so uh, fungi are spore producers. So one of the questions, actually the first question on the study guide says, what is the biological purpose of the mushroom or fruiting bodies of macroscopic fungi? So I want to address that question here. To do that, I'm going to pull up this figure. The fungi, multicellular fungi, they actually exist in the soil just beneath the surface in a structure called mycelium. Here you can see it down here, these thread-like structures look like, almost look like roots of a tree. Those are actually referred to as mycelium. And the mycelium is the fungus itself. That's technically where the fungus, with the form of the fungus year-round. It's only under ideal conditions of temperature and nutrients and sunlight and all these different uh, ideal conditions that the fungi actually reproduces and in doing so produces the mushroom cap itself. So here you can see the, the mushroom kind of in multiple stages. They're showing here is an early stage and a slightly more advanced stage and then ultimately it grows into a fully mature mushroom cap here. See, I think I have a bit, another picture. Here's another one showing the same kind of thing. So the mycelium are what actually exists year-round, and it's the fungus, or the, the mushroom cap that is, that's produced under the ideal conditions when it's time to reproduce. You can see another figure showing kind of the same thing, going through a variety of developmental stages here. So they do this as a way to release spores into the air. So the question again is, what is the purpose of the mushroom, which to, uh, to clarify, the mushroom is technically referred to as a quote unquote fruiting body. And so the purpose is to pr release spores and help them disperse into the air. And the idea is that the spores want to be elevated from the ground so that the wind can carry them theoretically a, a good distance away from the initial, uh, call it the, the mother fungus if you want to. And the idea is that if the spores all get released in the same area, there's more competition and fewer resources available for each one of those spores. So by elevating off the ground and allowing those to catch uh, catch from the wind, at least theoretically, that allows them to oops, sorry that allows them to uh, disperse further and ultimately spread those out so that each has a better chance of uh, getting its own nutrient supply. So that's the purpose of a uh, fruiting body of a multicellular fungi. And by the way, that's also one of the reasons why you tend to see fungi show up in the same place every year. If you've noticed, maybe you have fungi growing in your backyard or somewhere near you, they tend to show up in the same place. And that's because they never really go away. They're there year round, and it's only during certain times of the year that the, the mushroom is produced. And that's why you tend to see them in the same spot every time. Now, the microscopic fungi exist in two forms. One is called a yeast, the other is called a hyphae. Yeast are what we know as yeast, and these are actually a type of fungi. You may not have ever thought about it that way but yeast are actually a type of fungi. They're shown here in look an oval kind of round shape and uh, they reproduce through a process known as budding in uh, 
pull up the image here that in just one second. The other type are the hyphae, and these are what we refer to as mold fungi. So if you, you probably know what mold is, and that's actually a type of fungi called the hyphae fungi. At the microscopic level, they exist in a thread-like structure, kind of like the mycelium of the multicellular fungi. So once again, here's the mycelium. They're very much like the, the mycelium of the multicellular fungi. Here is a few images. So I want, here's the, here's a comparison of the yeast and the mold. Uh, here's an image of the, of the yeast actually budding. So here's an individual yeast cell. And what they actually do is they just kind of split apart. You'll probably find a better image of that here. There's a good picture. They just essentially split apart and kind of pinch in two, and they do this over and over and over again, and that's referred to as budding. Here's a, a diagram showing the cell budding out, pinching apart, and becoming two cells. Uh, go back here real quick. The the mold fungi, the hyphae. Here's what they look like up look like up, up close, and they actually are very similar in a lot of ways to the multicellular fungi, just on a much smaller scale. So you can actually see here, although it's not shown very well, you can actually see what you're looking at down here are the hyphae. And then what you're actually seeing here are the reproductive structures that they produce when they get ready to release their spores. So they also produce spores. And uh, the, the hyphae differentiate into these structures called a sporangia, which then actually carries the spores and releases those into the air, a lot like the multicellular fungi. Here's another figure showing the hyphae in the, here we go. Here's another figure showing the hyphae in the sporangia here, the spores. So here's the hyphae. They would spread out in whatever surface or what we call the substrate they're growing in. And then kind of like the mushroom, they extend this structure here called a sporangia that then releases the spores. So here you can see another picture of that. So they're actually like miniature, mushrooms in a lot of ways. They look a little different, but they are very, very similar in how they function. So the hyphae are like the mycelium, and the sporangia are kind of like the mushroom itself. And when you're actually looking at bread mold, for example, going back here, you're actually looking at thousands, if not millions, of individual little hyphae and sporangia growing up out of the bread. So the, the mycelium are spreading and kind of reaching their tentacles, so to speak, the hyphae, into the bread, sucking up the nutrients. And once they get enough nutrients, they start to then sprout these little sporangia, which then go on to release spores and will theoretically make even more fungi. So deep inside that substrate, you've got the mycelium, or excuse me, the hyphae, and then what you actually kind of start to see here is this fuzzy texture are those sporangia as they pop up and start to reproduce. Pretty gross, but that's the nature of fungi. And as they do so, they suck the nutrients out of whatever they're growing on, and that's one of the ways that they can actually decompose matter and break things down. Now, while we have two distinct forms, yeast and hyphae, some fungi can actually exist as both in what we refer to as dimorphic fungi. Dimor dimorphic fungi can exist in either form and can actually transition back and forth depending on the conditions. Uh, usually temperature is what changes them from one form to the other. One of the things I want you to know is that this is a characteristic of many pathogenic fungi. Often pathogens in, in the fungi kingdom are more adaptable to different environments. So all fungi at some point in their life will exist in the soil. I shouldn't say all fungi, I take that back. Most fungi, most fungi at some point in their life will exist outside of a living organism, in the soil, in the water, somewhere in the environment. And then if they get into a human or another animal, they have the potential, some species have the potential to cause infection. And typically it's those that are dimorphic because in some cases it's more desirable to be in a yeast form and then in other cases it's more desirable to be in a hyphae form. So, so by being able to transition back and forth, they're better able to adapt from the environment to a living thing and then theoretically back and forth. So they're kind of more adaptable in either type of uh, environment. Now, fungi, in a lot of ways, seem like plants. They look like plants to a certain extent, at least in the sense that they kind of have these root-like tentacles, 
They stay in the ground. They don't seem to move. They don't move around. So if you looked at them, you might think well, they're probably closely related to plants. But the truth is they're actually nothing at all like a plant other than the fact that they tend to grow out of the ground and they stay in one place. That's pretty much the only thing they actually have in common with plants. And uh, really what fungi are is they're considered heterotrophic, which is the same type of organism as you and I are, as humans and other animals, which means that we don't make our own food like plants. We have to consume food from preformed sources. So in other words, plants are the opposite of heterotrophic. They're what we call autotrophic. That means they make their own food using sunlight, for example. Every other type of organism is a heterotroph. And that just means they basically eat things that are already available for them. They don't make their own food, basically, is what it means. And so, in that sense, they're a lot like you and I, that we actually have to go find food and eat it as opposed to making it ourselves. So they're a lot like animals in that sense, and they're really actually nothing at all like plants. Uh, in fact, fungi are more closely related to insects than they are to plants. Now, most fungi are, are a type of heterotroph called a saprobe. So a saprobe is kind of like a division of the heterotrophic organism group. Saprobes are generally organisms that feed off of dead organic matter. So when we talk about them finding food, they usually feed off of some kind of dead, rotting source of food. Dead leaves, dead animals. Uh, this could also include waste, so it doesn't always have to be dead, but it could also mean things like uh, um, fecal matter and dead skin cells and hair and things like that. So saprobes typically feed off of uh, kind of decaying type matter. Um, in this sense, they typically are fairly harmless. Most saprobes are relatively harmless, meaning that they're not parasites or, or any kind of pathogen. And they're typically uh, those that just exist out in nature, relatively harmless to you and I. When we talked in, earlier in chapter one about the vast majority of microbes being harmless, the vast majority of microbes are what we consider saprobes. It means they just kind of feed off our stuff that's already dead, dead organic matter and waste, and they typically don't get energy from living things. Now there are some that are parasites, meaning that they do get their energy from a living organism, and that means that they obviously cause uh, potential problems, infections, and disease. So those that, that do lead to, have the potential that is to lead to infection called mycosis. And my, mycosis is a term for a fungal infection. Now luckily there's not very many human pathogens and not very many animal pathogens. There are however quite a few plant pathogens. We're not going to get into too many of those here, but it is important to recognize that there's a greater, much greater number of uh, fungal plant pathogens than there are fungal uh, animal pathogens. But here you are seeing a picture of, of a, someone who's got a fairly severe uh, form of mycosis in which the fungi is growing on the outer part of their foot here. So the idea is that fungi tend to be free living, meaning they don't require a host, and that goes back to the idea of them being saprobes. It means they just kind of grow in the environment. Um, if you remember in chapter one, part two, we talked about the difference between a primary pathogen and an opportunistic pathogen. We said primary pathogens are those that cause infection to people that are otherwise healthy, whereas opportunistic pathogens tend to cause infection in people that have a weakened immune system. I also added that opportunistic pathogens can sometimes take advantage of certain locations. Going back to this figure here, this picture, this individual could have an infection just because of the location. It could also be that they have a weak immune system, but on the outer part of your skin, you don't really have any immune cells. The very outer layer of your skin is a layer of dead skin cells. And here there's no actual immunity until you go beneath the surface a certain distance. So some fungi can actually cause infection on the very outer parts of our skin, sometimes in the hair. And that's because there's really no immune system there. Only when they penetrate below the surface do they start to activate the immune system. So when we say uh, most fungi are opportunists, what that means, opportunistic and pathogens, what that means is that they, they either only cause infection in people who have a weak immune system or they only cause infection in certain areas of the body where someone doesn't have any immune cells to begin with. There's only about four fungi that, that I am aware of that are considered primary fungal pathogens and those are, are fungi that could actually cause infection to a healthy individual. And uh, 
they're so rare I usually don't even talk about them but if you if you type in primary fungal pathogens you'll come up with a list of about four of those and they're actually able to suppress the immune system of a healthy individual and therefore cause infection once they've kind of weakened your immune system they're incredibly rare you could probably go an entire lifetime in the medical field and never see a single example of it so it's not something that you would ever really be likely to encounter or certainly be likely to ever experience yourself. But they do exist. There are documented cases of it. But typically when you have a fungal infection, usually, again, besides being on the outer part of your skin, besides being a part of the body where you don't have immune cells, outside of those, they are almost always in people who have a weak immune system. Someone who might be on, on chemotherapy, someone who might have an organ transplant, uh, who's on uh, immune suppressants, someone who maybe has a uh, unmanaged HIV and AIDS. Those are scenarios where the immune system has become so compromised and weakened for a variety of reasons that suddenly these fungi that would normally not be a problem and normally be very easy for our immune system to eliminate, suddenly they start to potentially cause infection. And that's where you typically see fungi, fungal infections. Now, the other, way, other place that fungi cause issues is with allergies. Mold and, and mold spores and things like that are a fairly common source of, of everyday allergies. So that's another issue where it's not real serious, but certainly uh, a problem. The other area where fungi are problematic is when it comes to plants and crops. As I mentioned back here, uh, there are lots of fungal plant pathogens. And what this basically means is that they will kind of devour your crop as they grow little mold spores and hyphae into the, into the food and, uh, and, and suck the nutrients out of it. In fact, they're such a major concern that in some cases, uh, untreated or in just a kind of a bad year, they can actually be responsible for up to 40% of, of fruit crop uh, damage. Every year is different, every farm is different, every location is different, so these are just kind of general estimates. But the idea is that fungi can potentially cause a serious issue to farmers if they are not uh, taking steps to remove that. That's why a lot of farms use fungicides in, in or considered a general type of pesticide. A lot of people are against that because they like to eat food that's free of those, which is understandable. But it's important to recognize that they use those for good reason because if they don't, in some cases you can lose up to half your crops just from the fungi alone, and not to mention insects or other pathogens or other types of par uh, pests that can come along and take out uh, an individual's crop. So there are good reasons why people use those types of chemicals, even though it's highly undesirable for the consumer for good reason. Now the last thing about fungi is that they can also be used in the lab to synthesize different types of compounds on an industrial level. Things like antibiotics, for example, penicillin is a, is a drug that is actually derived from a certain type of fungi. Uh, some of the cephalosporin types of antibiotics come from fungi, so they're actually uh, fairly efficient producers of, of antibiotic compounds. They can obviously be used to make yeast and, and they can, uh, or excuse me, alcohol from the yeast. Uh, baker's yeast and things like that are, are used to, to release CO2 and make bread rise. Uh, and even they, they can even be used to produce things like B vitamins. So they can be used to kind of churn out biological compounds that can be purified and sold for commercial uses. Okay, next we're going to take a look at the protease. If you remember, protease are the single celled eukaryotic organisms and they include the algae and the protozoa. So that's kind of a review from chapter one. Now, algae, if you remember, I, I analogized to little plants. They are photosynthetic, and, and they're, they're basically the opposite of heterotrophs. So you have autotrophs and heterotrophs, and algae are considered autotrophs, and that means that they make their own energy. And when it comes to something that makes its own energy, it rarely requires another organism for substance, which is what a parasite is. A parasite and a path or a pathogen is typically an organism that is feeding off of another organism for its own nutrients and by doing so causes harm. So when you find something like an algae that doesn't really need another organism to produce food, what you find is that they're rarely ever pathogenic because the only reason that an organism is typically pathogenic is because it's trying to feed off of another organism. Now there are exceptions. The textbook talks about an exception of a, super, a very rare type of algae that has kind of lost its ability to, to be photosynthetic and has become parasitic uh, by virtue of that loss of, of its own ability to make food. 
But that's it's definitely a total outlier, an exception, one I don't usually get into. There is an example, though, where, where algae can be problematic in that they, kind of like mushrooms, they can produce toxins that can be poisonous. And that's typically where you see the most issue when it comes to algae being uh, something along the lines of, of problematic to people or animals. So an example would be like a red tide. Pull up an image here of that. Red tide is a situation where these algae are releasing toxins. Certain types of algae are releasing toxins. And that actually then can uh, permeate into the water and kill fish and other animals in relatively large numbers. And red tide is a situation that the, the algae are essentially producing a toxin that affects other living things around them. Another example is a algae called Ciguatera. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Another one that produces a toxin that can uh, be accumulated in fish and actually cause uh, toxins to build up from smaller fish to larger fish as they move up the food scale. So here's a picture showing that. Here's the toxins from the algae, and they kind of move up the food chain, concentrating in the smaller fish, which then concentrate in the larger fish and then the larger fish, and then potentially someone that eats those could actually get sick. Not something that's real common, but in certain areas of the world shown here, uh, there is a chance of that happening, especially here in these red areas certain times of the year. So Ciguatera blooms happen to, will occur. A lot of times fishermen will avoid those areas during certain times of the year. But the, that's typically where algae cause the most amount of harm is when they release toxins. Here's another example, uh, Physisteria, Physicidia, not one I'd ever make you spell, don't worry about that. Another type of to uh, algae that releases toxins. This one actually goes on to cause skin lesions and ulcers on the skin that can actually be toxic and in certain cases have been shown to release large amounts of toxins in uh, very large algal blooms, algae blooms, and have been known in some cases to kill off millions and millions of fish. This here is a, an image shown from above where you see many, many thousands of fish all dying simultaneously and that is attributed to a large release of toxins from this type of algae. It's a very complicated uh, type of algae. Uh, this type of runoff, has, or this type of uh, algae, algal bloom and toxicity has actually been linked to agricultural runoff and they found in areas where there are agricultural farms, like pig farms especially, near water systems like oceans and rivers, these, are, these types of problems tend to be worse and that's because the, the fecal matter from the pig farms tend to get into the water which act as a source of nutrients for the algae which causes them to grow and potentially create these large blooms. So these are something that we've been able to control a little bit better in the last decade or so but have in the past been a major issue in areas where agricultural runoff has not been properly controlled. Okay, next we'll take a look at some of the protozoa. Protozoa are a uh, very, very, very diverse group of organisms. From chapter one, these are, uh, if you remember from chapter one, I talked about these and I discussed them being very difficult to kind of pigeonhole or describe in a very general sense. They're so broad. It's kind of like someone saying, describe an animal. And you'd have to say, okay, well, what kind of animal? Because there's lots of different types of animals, right? So protozoa are kind of the same way. They're, there's so many different types. So to start off here, 65,000 species. These are generally found in soil and water as their most common habitat. So they're not as ubiquitous as other organisms. You don't necessarily find these floating through the air. You wouldn't necessarily find these just scattered about any random place. They tend to concentrate in soil and water. But in those areas, they're pretty, pretty numerous. Lots and lots and lots of them. Um, most are free living and harmless. However, those that do cause infection tend to cause a fairly significant amount of infection in certain areas, especially. So malaria is an example. Although we don't f experience it here in North America, malaria is a parasite that inflicts, inflicts millions of people each year and can cause uh, upwards of a million deaths each year. Real quick about this middle paragraph here. The taxonomy of protees is expected to change over the next so many years, and, and so we don't really get into taxonomy here, so it's not really a concern. Uh, I think in the past I had gotten into taxonomy, which is why I had mentioned that there. But um, anyway, uh, 
they're a complicated group, and they're trying to reclassify them to make it a little more consistent. But that's not, don't worry about that paragraph there. Next, I want to talk about how to classify some of the protozoa, just to give you an idea of some of the different types. So this is kind of a way to break them down a little bit and at least give you an idea of what are some of the more common types. So it'd be kind of like saying uh, reptiles versus mammals versus birds, that kind of thing. So we're kind of putting them in these kind of very broad categories to give you just kind of a basic idea of what are some of the most common types. So in this case, they, they group them by their ability to move, so modal groupings. So we have really four groups, three of which are actually based on motility, and one is then actually defined as a based on a lack of motility. So you have motility being uh, the characterizing feature of these three, and then a lack of it being the characterizing feature of the fourth. So you, the first one are called pseudopods. It's pronounced pseudopod. Pseudo means false. Pod, pod, or podia means foot. So this stands for false foot, and that has to do with how they move their cell membrane. This is actually what we talked about in Chapter 5, Part 1, where I showed a video of the uh, microfilaments or the actin filaments pushing a cell, and I talked about cell crawling. This is actually how the pseudopods move through cell crawling. Flagellates use a flagella. We talked about a flagella. And ciliates use a cilia. We talked about those as well. And then the, the last group down here, the AP complexa, they're defined by a lack of motility. And another interesting characterization about them is that they're all considered obligate endoparasites. So take the first part, obligate, meaning that they are always, and then parasites, take this part, they're basically always a parasite. So AP complexa are largely defined by the fact that they are always parasitic, whereas these other ones here sometimes are, sometimes aren't. And the other part, endo, means that they're always parasitizing inside of a cell. So they actually infect an organism inside of their cells. And that's how all of them cause infection, at least in some part of their life cycle. So real quick, let's look at a couple representations of these four, make a few quick drawings here. We'll keep this relatively simple. So the first one, the pseudopods, they tend to have a very irregular shape. And in fact, a lot of times people refer, although this is not always the case, but a lot of people may be more, may be more familiar with the term uh, amoeba. Amoeba is an example of a pseudopod. And just to give you an idea, this is what amoeba looked like. The way, and here's a picture even showing a pseudopod. The way that this works, f so first of all, amoeba have a very irregular shape. They tend to be drawn kind of like a blob, kind of like those pictures we're showing there. So they're just very irregular. But the way that they actually move is from the extension of the membrane. Again, this goes back to the first part of chapter five, if you want to refer back to that, or maybe you're skipping ahead. This is essential to understand it, but it helps if you go back to that. What they basically do is they extend out these actin filaments in an area that they want to move. So let's say, for example, they want to move in this direction. What they do is they extend out these microfilaments, and that actually pushes the membrane in that general direction. And so they end up then kind of contracting these, and ultimately what it does is it slides the membrane in this direction. And then on the back half here, they contract on this, on this side, and ultimately the organism kind of moves in that direction. And the term pseudopod derives from the term false pseudo, false foot, podia, or pod stands for foot. And the idea is that someone thought it was uh, appropriate because when they extend this membrane out, it, I guess, looked like a false foot to somebody. So random naming, that's what they decided to call it. But that's because of the way they extend the membrane and, and kind of move outward. And so that's something you can kind of see here, not really well. You have to go, you can find an animation. I showed one, or a, a video that is, I showed that in the last uh, section there if you want to go back and look at that. Lots of interesting figures here of the amoeba. Um, the next one are the flagellates. These are organisms with a flagella. We'll just draw a simple one here, even though you kind of already know what these are. These are organisms with a flagella. Now, in the chapter four, the prokaryotes, we talked about all the different flagella arrangements, and we talked about monotrichus and amphitrichus and peritrichus. 
When it comes to the eukaryotes, there are so many different types of arrangements that we just really don't get into naming them quite like that. It, 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 naming systems are, are good when you have a handful of distinct types. When it comes to the eukaryotes, you don't have that. You have such a wide variety that it's no longer really appropriate to start trying to name those, especially in the introductory class, because there'd be such a great number that it becomes much more complicated. So that, that's why we don't do that there. So just flagellates, organisms with the flagella. Finally, the ciliates. Ciliates are organisms with the cilia. And these are organisms that um, utilize the cilia for movement in this case. So if you remember from first part of chapter four, chapter five, sometimes they use these for filter feeding. So in this case, we're talking about how they use them for movement. So these are little hair-like extensions that occur all around the outside of the cell, like this. And you just keep going. Those are the ciliates. The last one, the AP complexa, they're defined by a lack of motility. As I already mentioned, they're obligate endoparasites. And essentially what they have evolved to do is utilize other organisms for their movement. So they don't have their own motility because they tend to infect other organisms and then use those organisms to spread themselves around. Here you see a picture of the malaria parasite. Uh, um, which is a, an example of an AP complexin. And this isn't necessarily the best figure, but it's showing some of the different life cycles of the AP complexa. And you can see that they tend to focus around different cells within the human body, for example. So here they're bursting out of a cell, infecting a cell, bursting out of that cell. This would be where they infect the liver, break out of the liver cells, go on to infect red blood cells, break out of the liver, the red blood cells, and then go on, and this is where they would go on into a mosquito, not shown here, but they would complete their life cycle in a mosquito where they would reproduce through meiosis and then go on to infect uh, through the bite of a, of a human. Here's the mosquito, not very well clearly shown, but a mosquito biting the human and reinfecting. So their life cycles tend to revolve around infecting cells and then breaking out and going on to infect more cells. Um, when it comes to the protozoa, they have a lot of complicated life cycles. Looking at that last one there, you see a variety of different life stages. But protozoa can be broken down into two general life categorizations, two life stage categorizations. One is called the trophozoite life stage, and the other is called a cyst life stage. If you refer back to chapter four, part two, we talked about the um, bacterial endospores. And we talked about the vegetative life cycle and the, the, the spore life cycle, uh, uh, stage that is, the vegetative stage and the spore stage. This is very similar in a lot of ways. The, so the trophozoi is a lot, in a lot of ways kind of like the vegetative stage, the active or modal feeding stage. And the cyst in a lot of ways is like the endospore where it's dormant and resistant, uh, also uh, kind of like a seed. So the cyst is a life stage that allows it to survive in the environment in order for the conditions to be favorable. And this trophozoite is the life stage that actually moves around and goes on to infect and acquire food. So it's a lot like the seed in the cyst stage and the active adult stage in the trophozoite. Uh, being able to form the cyst makes them able to resist harsh environmental conditions. Now these are not as survivable as the endospores. Endospores are much more difficult to kill but they're comparable in that it does help them survive certain unfavorable conditions like low water, low nutrients, high levels of heat, things like that. Cysts can, uh, can really kind of help them survive until the conditions become favorable again. It talks about that down here in this last paragraph. Here's a figure out of your textbook showing that. Here's a trophozoite stage. It tends to, uh, uh, so. So as example here, it's drying up, lack of nutrients, so the environment is becoming less favorable. So what it does is it starts to kind of form almost like a cocoon around itself. It starts to kind of wall itself in, and this is where it starts to form the cyst here, kind of uh, shelling itself up, so to speak. This allows it to survive harsh conditions. Here you see the, the cyst is fully formed. And then if the conditions become favorable again, moisture, nutrients, things like that return, it'll break out of that 
cyst stage and return back into the trophozoite stage. So these life cycles just revolve basically around favorable and unfavorable conditions. So when it's unfavorable, low nutrients, low water, goes into the cyst. When it becomes favorable, pops back out, goes into the trophozoite stage. And this here is actually a real image showing a cyst here and the trophozoite emerging from that here. On this slide, I've just got a couple examples of some important protozoa pathogens. We'll talk about these in the lab later on in the semester. So for now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with these, but this is a few things uh, of examples here. One is an example, uh, or two examples rather, of a, of a pathogenic flagellate. One is a, one that causes a disease called Chagas disease. Another is called African sleeping sickness. So they're, they're fairly different diseases, but they're both caused by a flagellated parasite uh, called trypanosoma. And we'll actually look at a similar species of trypanosoma, a cousin to these, uh, in the microscope later in the semester in the lab. But these are examples of a pathogenic flagellate. And let's take a look here from the web at what these look like. Trypanosoma. Here you can see these are kind of a flagellated type looking protozoa. So here you can see the flagella. I think that, that looks like a drawing. Here we go. These look like real high resolution images here. There's some red blood cells. Here are the uh, uh, the trypanosomas themselves. This is more like what we're going to see under the microscope, more of a two-dimensional low resolution microscope image. But here again are the, the trypanosomes and these are red blood cells in which they're swimming around. So they're blood-borne pathogens. And when they take samples of these, they tend to take them from infected animals uh, in a blood sample, which is why you typically see them swimming around in blood. Here's a better uh, illustration with more detail here of what these look like. So those are examples of some flagellated pathogens. Uh, an example of an amoebic, amoeba pathogen or pseudopod pathogen is one called Intamoeba histolytica. Intamoeba histolytica is one that tends to cause infection through food and water contamination. Here's some images of intamoeba. Here's a microscope image of intamoeba. Here's one showing this trophozoite in the cyst. It's a drawing, obviously. Here's some images of a variety of different forms. Looks just like kind of like a more of a circular amoeba. So nothing real special. I think that's I'm not, I don't know that's a computer animation there. Um, but uh, intamoeba is one that is strictly a human pathogen, and it tends to come from fecal contamination. So some people are infected, and they shed it through the feces, which gets into the environment, and can be picked up from contaminated water or contaminated crops. So while it's not common here in the North America, it is somewhat common in Central America and other parts of the world. Let's see if we can find Intamoeba histolytica. Uh, find that throughout the world. Here we go. Here's uh, showing uh, areas where it is more common. So in the uh, dark green you know, are areas where it is more common. So only I guess certain parts of Central America down here. Uh, in the lower parts of Central America. Um, uh, up here in the northern parts of North America, Africa, places like that, actually, it's more common. So not something that we really ever see here, but something that is uh, somewhat common in other parts of the world. And then we talked about malaria already. Malaria is an example of an AP complexin parasite. And then what I'm going to have you read about here on, in one of the online articles is one called toxoplasmosis. Uh, bacteria or ba the bacteria or the uh, protozoa is called Toxoplasma gondii, that is, and it causes the disease Toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is one that you can actually get from infected cat feces. And here they show a picture of a cat because it tends to revolve around the life cycle of cats. But the trophozoite in this case is what's infective and can get into the body and potentially cause infection. This is one that doesn't usually cause infection unless you have a weakened immune system. So typically you can be infected as a healthy individual and not typically have any symptoms according to most research. 
and uh, only if someone has uh, a very severe immune compromising condition. It's fairly common for, or not, at least it was common at one point for people who had HIV and AIDS to uh, potentially develop, it was called toxoplasmosis of the brain. Let's see if we can find a picture of that. Uh, they're just showing brain scans here. But toxoplasmosis of the brain, I'm assuming that's what that's showing here, would occur in someone who typically has a very weak or no immune system. Usually, uh, I'm most familiar with it when, when people who have untreated HIV and AIDS. Ultimately, the infection migrates to the brain and, and, and can cause pretty serious issues there. Now, the other area that toxoplasmosis can be a problem is in pregnant women. And if you've ever been expecting or had a child, you may have been told by your doctor or others to avoid cleaning the cat box. And that's because cats are the carriers, or not, not the only source of it, but they're what we call the um, what we call the definitive host of the parasite. And what that means is that they're able to allow the, the parasite to reproduce. So they're the ones that shed active uh, the active cysts and the active uh, parasite in their feces. And they say that if a pregnant woman is to become infected with toxoplasmosis for the first time during a pregnancy, it might actually migrate into the placenta and cause pretty serious issues with the developing fetus, anything from um, genital defects or even potentially death, stillbirth. Um, so for someone who's, who's pregnant or expecting, toxoplasmosis is more of a concern than somebody who otherwise would be perfectly healthy and have a normal immune function. Otherwise, it's not usually an issue. And from my understanding, it's pretty rare, even for, an, for a, a woman who's expecting to actually get infected with the toxoplasma parasite. But something that you would want to be aware of if you are expecting, you typically just want to avoid any kind of contact with cat feces. Not like you have to be told that. Anyway, but that just basically means cleaning the cat box and washing your hands really good if you happen to do that. Okay, last group that we'll talk about here are called the helminths. Helminths are parasitic worms and they tend to come in one of three forms, tapeworms, flukes, and roundworms. The, and there's actually really kind of two major groupings here, which are the flatworms, which include tapeworms and flukes, and then the nematodes, which are roundworms. So the term platyhelminth is a, uh, is a more technical word term to describe flatworms, and the term nematode is a more technical term to describe roundworms. In fact, these are actually uh, animal groupings. These are some of the uh, major animal phylum that these are listed within. So what I want you to know are what are the three types and what are the two major groupings and what are the different types of groupings being recognized. Platyhelminths or flatworms, nematodes or roundworms. I won't make you spell those, but just be able to recognize them in a multiple choice. So here we see examples of some of the flatworms. This is a tapeworm. This is uh, over here is a, a drawing illustration. And over here, this is a real image. They tend to be segmented, but have a flat body. So they can kind of grow through addition of segments and uh, you have what's called here a scolex, which is the head which attaches to the intestinal lining and then it, as it absorbs nutrients it grows through the addition of segments and they continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and more disgusting and they can get really really big I think the largest one on record is something like 90 feet or something like that is something crazy so uh, not usually that get that big but they can fairly get fairly large if given an opportunity uh, drugs will easily kill these some uh, um, uh, deworming medications will easily uh, eliminate those. Very rare in people, somewhat common in dogs and, and cats. We'll talk about those here in a second. Over here is another type of flatworm. These are called the trematodes or the flukes, and they consist of, consist of it's a single body uh, shape here that is flat and almost looks like a leech, kind of has a, a mouth-like opening that they absorb nutrients through. These are all real images, believe it or not, of various types of, of worms here. This is a round worm. This is a round worm here. These down here are tapeworms. So these are close-up images down here of the scolex of the tapeworm. Going back here, this is what we're looking at here. That's just a, a drawing. These are high-resolution microscope images of what those look like up close from a couple different species here. So you can see a couple different types. They don't have the name of the species here, but, but there's a variety of different tapeworms they're all very similar, but they have slightly different anatomical features. So 
you can see, I, think, I believe this is like the pork tapeworm here, I believe, and I believe this is the uh, dog or cat tapeworm here, I think. Uh, interestingly, these, these here don't actually absorb nutrients through their mouth, through the scolex. They just use that to attach. They just use it to grip on to the intestinal lining, and then they actually absorb nutrients across their body. They actually use diffusion and osmosis to suck in nutrients across their body. The roundworms actually have a true opening, a mouth here, which looks fairly devilish, but they actually grip on to the intestinal lining and they actually do suck in nutrients through their mouth like you might expect. They're actually one of the first organisms to have a complete digestive tract, meaning they take in nutrients through the mouth and expel waste through the anus. They're one of the first organisms to actually have a complete system in which nutrients go in one direction and come out the other. Many organisms below them in the uh, animal world Less de less developed, less advanced organisms like the tapeworms, which are which are less de developed, more primitive, they actually don't have that, and they they essentially just suck in nutrients through across their body and then expel waste in a similar kind of way. The helmets tend to revolve around three life stages, and these are the egg, the larvae, and the adult. So the egg is typically where you get infected. That's typically a microscopic structure that is ingested through food or some other type of contaminating material. The egg will develop into a larvae, which will then go on to develop into an adult, typically somewhere in the intestinal lining. The egg is usually what allows it to get into your body. The egg will survive the digestive acid in your stomach, at least theoretically, and will then develop inside the small intestine or even the large intestine where there's less of a harsh environment where they can survive there. Many of these are considered hermaphrodites, meaning they have both male and female reproductive organs, and they can mate with themselves, essentially. They don't necessarily need a mating partner to reproduce, and so if you get a single worm with inside you, they can go on to produce more and theoretically reinfect the same host over and over again. Many of these types of organisms have complex life cycles. I misspelled that word right there. Take the E off that. But many of them have complex life cycles where they can actually go through multiple hosts. Sometimes they go into one host, but sometimes they'll actually go through a series of hosts. And I'll go th give you an example of that here in just a second. So where they have multiple hosts, they'll typically have at least two, in which one is referred to as the definitive and the other is referred to as the intermediate. The intermediate host is typically where larval development occurs, and it's usually where the egg develops into the larvae. And at some point then what they have to do is actually exit the intermediate host and then go on to infect what's called the definitive host. And this is where adulthood and mating take place and where the eggs are shed and then go on to restart the life cycle over again. Kind of crazy how that works, but they actually have developed these very complex life cycles over many years of evolution. And most of them still revolve around those today. Not, not all, but a good deal of them do. And I'll give you an example of one of those here in a second. So an example is from one of the more common types of tapeworms called Diphyllidium caninum, more commonly known as the dog or cat tapeworm. So if you have a dog or cat and if they've ever had tapeworms, then there's a good chance this was the species that they had, very likely, the most likely uh, species that they would have picked up. Now, the way this typically works is that the egg and the larvae goes to the intermediate host, which is actually a flea. So the intermediate host is the flea. Now I'll find, I'll give you a, a diagram of this here in just a second, but go ahead and write that down for now. The intermediate host is the flea, F-L-E-A. What organisms can serve as the definitive host? Well, typically it's either dogs or cats, but it could also be people, very rarely. But typically it's dogs or cats, and, and that's mostly just because those are the most common types of organisms that we have uh, close to us that tend to get fleas. So, so there actually could be a wide variety of other organisms, but rather than list all of them, we'll keep it to one of the most common. I pulled up a figure here on the web to show us this, and here's that figure. So here's a dog, and what happens is, is the dog picks up an infected flea. And this is kind of like a chicken and the egg thing here. So what you want to draw, and I'll draw this with you here, what we want to draw, and you can just write this actually, right, just dog 
slash cat or you can get fancy and draw a picture there and what we're going to show then is starting here with an so we're assuming that we're starting with an infected animal okay and again it's kind of like a chicken and the egg scenario where what came first we don't know exactly but as we see it today the way it works today if we were to go out and explore as of right now we see that there are infected animals such as dogs and and they have adult tapeworms inside their intestinal tract those, those tapeworms will shed eggs that come in the form of what's called a proglottid. So if you're eating, stop. And proglottids look, oops, pro, proglottids. Mm, that's not what I'm looking for here. Let's find it here. Here we go, that's what I'm looking for. This is a tapeworm proglottid, not as gross as I thought actually. But this is actually part of the segment of the worm that contains the eggs inside of it here. So this is actually uh, a, a part of the tapeworm that contains the, the eggs within it. And what's gonna happen is that these are actually going to break off and then crawl outside of the animal. And when that happens, they're fairly disgusting. That's what I was looking for. Here's one. They tend to look like little, uh, like little grains of rice or like little inchworms. They actually crawl and move. Here's another picture of them. Uh, if you've ever had a dog or cat that has these, one of the easiest ways to tell is if you look near their back end, you'll typically see these little white looking things that look like little grains of rice near their back end. Let's see if we can find. Okay, so here's a better view of what those would look like on your dog or cat. I'm sure you love me for this. Uh, close up here. Oh, that doesn't look very high resolution. Um, here's a picture. Uh, they tend to look like this around the back end there. All right, moving on. You get the idea. Here's a picture of a, another picture of the egg itself. This has got usually somewhere around 12 to 15 different eggs within it. So the proglottid breaks out from the dog, or it could be a cat. Where am I at here? And here, here's what that's showing. And then ultimately, here's what has to happen. It actually has to be picked up by a flea larvae. So flea have their own life cycles, and one of the things that they do is they go through a larval stage that actually looks a lot like a worm, kind of like a, uh, um, almost like a, um, uh, a butterfly larvae. And they actually feed off of the tapeworm eggs. And what they do is they eat the eggs and when they eat the eggs, that actually allows the egg to develop into uh, the next life stage within the flea larvae. So essentially you shed the egg and the flea larvae eats the eggs and that actually allows the, the tapeworm to develop inside the flea larvae, which I know that sounds really totally unbelievable, but this is actually where we come back to what I said earlier about the intermediate and the definitive host. So what's, in the, what, what's happening is the, the definitive host is the animal which is shedding the eggs. So in, the, in our example here, it's the dog. So the dog is shedding the eggs, and the intermediate host is the flea, which is actually picking up the eggs during its larval stage. And what ends up happening is the flea larvae and the tapeworm are actually developing simultaneously. And as the flea goes on to develop into an adult flea, the tapeworm is actually going on to develop further inside that flea gut. Now, in order for the tapeworm to complete its life cycle, what has to happen is an infected flea has to actually be swallowed by another animal, like a dog or cat. That actually allows the tapeworm developing inside the flea to get back inside that animal, migrate down into the intestinal lining, and develop further where it can start the process over again. So pretty crazy how that works. You essentially have a dog or cat that's shedding infected, uh, shedding uh, eggs, and then just by chance a flea has to, uh, a flea larvae has to eat it, and then go on to the itself be eaten by another animal. You might think, well, what are the odds of that? Well, individually speaking, they're not very good. But when it comes to tapeworms and fleas, they both proliferate in very very large numbers, and they tend to shed thousands and thousands of eggs and on a routine basis. Fleas themselves can go on to produce thousands of eggs, and the tapeworms can produce thousands of eggs. And it only takes one of those coming together in order for that to happen. And so while the odds of any individual being successful are pretty low, they kind of compensate in volume. 
and they put out massive amounts of these. And so just by chance alone, one of them is successful, and that typically is all it takes to start the life cycle over again. These are actually more common in cats because cats are more prolific groomers, and they're actually more likely to eat the flea than a dog is. And so t cats tend to be more common that, that they are more likely to swallow an infected flea than a dog, although they both can obviously do it. Uh, as a side note, if you've, if you've got fleas, it's usually just a matter of time before your animal will develop tapeworms. And that's usually the way that works. So if you have a flea problem long enough, eventually you'll get tapeworms. And if you have a dog or cat that has tapeworms, odds are they either currently have fleas or have had fleas in the past. And that's uh, kind of a general rule of thumb that those tend to go hand in hand. A couple more notes here. Worms are pretty rare in the US outside of our pets. It's pretty uncommon for people to pick them up. However, in different parts of the world, these are significantly more common. Uh, so outside of the US, they are uh, fairly common in, in third world nations, although in the first world nations like, like the United States and others, they're pretty uncommon. Interesting side note, there's been a lot of research that has started to indicate that worms may actually be a natural way for the body to suppress allergies. And this is a kind of an odd thing, so to untease it just a little bit here, Worm infections were thought to be fairly common, almost normal, for a huge part of human development and evolution. Looking back in history, there's lots of evidence to suggest that most animals would have had worm infections, including humans, throughout early parts of development. Today, we still see the same thing. In many parts of the world, many animals carry worms on a routine basis. So, so worm infections are only uncommon by today's standards where we have become more hygienic and we have drugs and, and hygiene methods to prevent them prevent us from being infected. So it's only been in recent history is the point that we've actually largely eliminated worm infections from the modern world. Research is actually suggesting that while that may be good in some ways there may be actually unintended consequences and it turns out that our immune system may actually have some benefit by having a worm infection present. It turns out we actually have immune cells and even antibodies that are designed to target worm infections primarily. And because they were so common at one point, the theory is that our, our immune system developed a whole mechanism to target these types of worms. The idea behind this is that when we, went, when we eliminated worms, we now left a part of our immune system with essentially nothing to do or at least much less to do in the absence of what was a, at one point a very common infection. So what they think is that given the absence of the more primary problem of worms, parts of our immune system have gone on to become more reactive and end up becoming triggered by less serious factors such as pollen and dust and, and smaller uh, allergens. And, and this is evident in the fact that people who have worm infections rarely if ever have allergies. They noticed this when treating worm infections in, in third world countries. They found that prior to treating the worms that these kids they would never have allergies but that, and that was never really something that they paid attention to until they started to treat the children and then they found that in a large number of them after treating them they would start to develop allergic symptoms. So this was recognized over and over again that they started to come up with this idea that worms and allergies might actually coexist since then, they've found lots and lots of evidence. If you type this in in Google, you'll find um, all sorts of different types of all sorts of different types of papers and uh, proposals on this. Uh, could worms in your gut cure allergies? Got allergies? Blame parasites? Future worm therapy? Why parasites may be good? I'm going to try and come up with a new online article for this, but uh, this is uh, still a lot of information here yet to be worked out. We'll talk about some of this in a little more detail, I'll at least bring this back up later when we talk about uh, the immune system. But there's actually some pretty specific links to certain types of cells in our immune system and, and this is all fairly well um, proposed based on kind of how the different parts of our immune system work. So basically the idea is at one point our immune system was occupied, when we removed the worms we essentially uh, um, freed those immune cells up to react in other ways. and uh, Really, if you look at what an allergy is, 
it's your immune system gone awry. It's your immune system reacting to things that aren't harmful that only cause irritation. So your immune system is designed to kill things that are harmful and eliminate infection. And what's happening with an allergy is that your body is responding to something that's not harmful, but it thinks that it is, and ultimately ends up causing more discomfort than good. And things like pollen and dust aren't gonna hurt you, but they can trigger your immune system, which makes you irritated. And so that's kind of really what an allergy is, an inappropriate immune response. So that's kind of how these are thought to relate take away the worms, now your immune system is, is bored and starts to react to things that it shouldn't. Oversimplified explanation. But, but lots of research suggests that that could be true. And they're actually coming up with new ways of uh, potentially treating allergies by using uh, different components of, of the worm as a way to maybe suppress that. And you can look into that online if, that, if that's something that you find interesting. Okay, that's the end of chapter five. Uh, as always, let me know if you have any questions. Send me an email, ask me questions in class. We'll go to chapter six next where we talk about the viruses. Have a great day and I will see you in class next time. Goodbye.